Hey tribe, welcome to HD Designs Crochet. I'm Heather and this is my channel all about crochet and being a crochet designer. Uh, today I'm actually wearing something that I knitted. This is an Aaron cardigan. I had the pattern out of a book called Vintage Knitting. It's the first piece of Aaron knitting I've ever done. It's pretty much like the first piece of knitting. Other than a very chunky jumper, and a couple of pairs of socks that I've done as well. I'm really pleased with it. Other than, I feel like it's a little bit too, um, it needs to be a little bit more snug because I have quite narrow shoulders. But other than that, I'm really, really pleased with it. I chose to go with mismatch buttons as well. <laughs> and I'm here for it. The granny squares behind me are part of a blanket that I've started putting together and I think over the next coming months you will see that grow and grow and grow. Today I am going to answer some questions that I received on this video. And these questions were left by Totally Stitchcraft, which is Sarah. I've printed them off. Thank you so much for your questions, Sarah. Um, it came to reply to your comment. I came to reply to your comment and thought, there's so much, where do I start? Maybe I should send you a voice note. And then I thought, I will just record and give you all of your answers. So, the first question is, and I've made notes as well, because I've got so much good stuff to share with you. So Sarah put, first off, thank you for making this two part series. Um, secondly, here are my questions about crochet in the world of selling crochet. And your first question is, how do you price a crochet ready-made item, a ready-made crochet item. Now, I no longer sell made to order. It's something I used to do. Um, I used to sell either made to order or something I'd already crocheted. Um, but I changed the business model of HGDC and so it's not something I do. However, when I did do it, I took into account the cost of materials, my time spent, so however many hours that was, um, then you need to know what the living wage or minimum wage is in the area that you live. You need to factor in taxes and profit and use all of those to reach your figure. Um, I did talk about this with Nicola of the Crochet Cabin and um, that's in a video which I will link above for you. She sells kits and some ready-made items and we did touch upon how um, to go about pricing all of those things. So hopefully you'll find plenty of information in that video as well. Your next question is, how do you price a crochet pattern? Is it based on complexity? Um, I've seen patterns for $2 to $7 or even $15. How do I price that appropriately? It's honestly shot in the dark for me. Okay, so yes, there are so, so many factors and so many designers have like varying as you said, some would be selling something for $2 and some would be selling it for $15 and it really just does depend, really does depend on who it is that you are buying from. There are so many different factors to consider. So I've listed here, has your pattern been tech edited? Um, is it a garment? Is it an accessory? Is it homeware? How many sizes are available if it is a garment? How much did it cost? for you to produce the pattern. So did you pay for tech editing? Have you paid for testing? Or did you pay for your yarn? Um, have you got any guidelines from maybe a yarn brand that you're working in conjunction with? Um, how long did it take for you to produce the pattern? All these different factors sort of get smooshed together and then each designer comes up with their own pricing. So for, the, for HDDC, my scale is for a accessory, so maybe a pair of slippers or a bag, then I charge four pounds for British pounds sterling, which in USD, let me check what that is. So four British pounds is the equivalent of about $5.50 in American dollars. And then I will price my garments at eight pounds, which then is $11 in American dollars. And I have my own formula of reaching this. 
my top tips would be to go and look at your favorite designers and see what it is that they're charging so that you can get some sort of guidance um i know it does vary but if you see somebody that sells patterns that are similar to yours then that's going to be a helpful starting point another top tip is to find a designer that is within the same region or currency as you as well because um what might be acceptable to what might be acceptable in US dollars might not be acceptable in Canadian dollars um, or the prices might differ because of the um, not translation what's that word because of the differences in the currency they might wildly differ so you want to find somebody who's in the same region and with the same currency as you as well a couple of things to bear in mind as well when you are pricing your pattern if you have had it tech edited then you can charge a higher price because you have not only had the cost of production the cost of the tech editing that you need to cover but also that it has been checked and so it's less likely to have any mistakes in it um, and most patterns like it's expected that patterns have about nine sizes now so if you have the nine sizes and it's okay for you to be charging the higher price whatever you class as a higher price but if you have only like three sizes and then it's not been tech edited but you're charging a higher price you might come into a little bit of um not backlash but there might be comments from people as to why it is the price that it is ultimately at the end of the day you need to be comfortable with your own price you need to feel that the price fairly reflects the value and you I guess it boils down, boils down to being heart led so do you feel comfortable charging that price do you feel comfortable asking someone to pay it would you feel comfortable paying that price because if you will only pay one dollar for a pattern no matter whose pattern it is then why are you charging fifteen dollars for your own pattern is it that you don't value other people's work and maybe you should or like that's something that you need to talk to yourself about um and another thing to consider is that sewing patterns have a much much higher price than the average price of a crochet or knitting pattern i'm not 100 percent sure why this is but if you go on a sewing pattern company um even if it is just a digital download you do not get the physical pattern it will still be anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds whereas you wouldn't pay that much for a crochet pattern and I really do think that it is how much the consumer values your pattern that really does influence that um, and on the same note that if all of your patterns are free or you charge a very very low price you could devalue your own brand and your own work because if you see something that is a lower price you might not necessarily think that's a bargain you might actually think why is it so cheap what's wrong with it so i think there is quite a bit of psychology that goes into setting the price as well um and as I said, it's going to vary for each person. You just need to be led by your heart. What do you feel comfortable with? Um, the HDDC pricing is that for an accessory such as slippers or a bag, it's £4, um, which I'm in the UK. So in US dollars, that is around $5.50. And then for a garment, I charge £8. And so that is about US dollars um and i know that i'm seen as one of the slightly more higher priced patterns out there um again i'm happy with the value that i've put in i'm really happy with my patterns and it's also a price that i'm happy to pay for another pattern that is really well put together and really helpful um and fits really well as well 
because pricing is such a huge, huge topic, I've actually written an entire section about this in my second workbook. So I have started writing a series of workbooks for crochet designers because when I started out, I couldn't really find the information that I wanted and I couldn't find the community that I was looking for so that I could build my skills and my knowledge. So I just created that myself. Um, and my first workbook is about grading a pattern, so how to take your design and um, produce it in sizes extra small up to five extra large. And then my second workbook is about releasing that pattern. And I've got a whole section that not only covers, there's an entire section that covers everything that should be included in your pattern from sizing information, abbreviations from yardage, yarn substitutions, from photography, uh, from copyright information, drawing, a schematic, all of those things. I've also included, I also cover pricing in detail and it goes through all the different factors to consider like your local taxes, um, fees that you might need to pay like seller fees and location considerations and a rough of how to come up with your pattern price. More like guidelines of things to take into account and how to reach your own prices. So if you would want to know more then that'd be a really really good resource for you and I will put a link below to the waiting list and also when it's out I'll put a link there to that guide and then you can go and have a look if it's for you or not. So I know that's not like giving you a hard and fast rule because there isn't one, there is not one size fits all, but hopefully it's giving you um, a lot more to think about so you don't feel like you're just putting a shot into the dark. What was your wording? Yeah, a shot in the dark. Hopefully it's put a little bit more light onto that for you. Okay, so on to question three, which is what's the best place to sell your patterns online? Ravelry, Etsy, your own website, question mark. I'm sure this answer will have something to do with SEO and using the mass audience um, platforms already have to bring people to your platforms. Okay, so I have written, if you are new, then consider using Ravelry, Etsy, Lovecrafts, Payhip, Pinterest. And if you are established, then consider having your own website and also Instagram shops, Facebook shops. So, let's go into those in a little bit more detail. If you are a new designer, maybe it's your first pattern, maybe you've got one to five patterns, um, I would say that the best places to be are Ravelry, if you can access it, because of the sheer amount of people that are on there. Etsy, because again, it is another very well-known and well-used platform to obtain patterns. And then Lovecrafts, because again, you would go on there to buy yarn and then you would also then download a pattern. Um, if you wanted maybe your own platform but you weren't wanting to invest in a website then Payhip is a good alternative um, and that's got its own fees and whatnot but you basically have your own page with all of your own patterns on there. Um, and then also you can list things on Pinterest. Um, Pinterest is really good because a lot of creative people spend a lot of time on there looking for ideas, which I definitely do. Um, if you have a finite amount of time, if you have time restrictions, then maybe just pick two to three of those and just do them really, really well and keep them updated and promote them. Um, but if you have a bit more time, then pick them all. Pick pick even more, like go out there, find where other people list their patterns and have the, have yours on there as well. I know there's Ribbler and there's a couple of other platforms that you can sell patterns on. Um, every platform has its own fees, but that's just part and parcel. Like if you don't want to spend a dollar or something on seller fees, then you're not gonna make the $4 that you re would receive in profit from selling it. So it's just, part and parcel of being a seller. 
if you're more established, like you've got five plus patterns and you know you want to stick to designing for like more long term, like you're in it, you're in it to win, then I would 110% recommend that you get your own website. Now, if you are new, then you're absolutely right. The SEO of, other of the other platforms such as Ravelry, Pinterest, Lovecrafts is amazing. So SEO means search engine optimization and it just means that when you search in Google granny square jumper or granny square sweater, then if you've listed that enough times within your pattern and within the listing on the website, you're likely to come up quite high. And it just means that when people search in Google or whatever search search engine, then they get the results they want. And so if you're selling something, you want to pop up there. And because Etsy and Ravelry have so many people using it, um, Etsy particularly will push certain um, listings that they see are doing well and are getting a lot of traffic. So you can definitely um, benefit from that without a doubt. Rather than having to have your own traffic going to these websites, you use um, the websites huge amount of traffic to draw people to you instead and that's really useful when you're starting out. Um, but with that it has the downside of you might pay a little bit more in fees, Etsy does have quite high fees um, and then if it's not your own shop so you have a space within Etsy, a space within Ravelry but it's not your own shop then you are beholden to them. So for example, when Ravelry had the issues or has the issues of its accessibility, if your, um, if your makers can't access it, then they can't purchase. And also if something was to happen and that website was to be down or Etsy decided to close your shop, then you don't really have um, as much available to you as you would if it was your own website. I would say that if you are new then maybe hold back from getting a website unless you're like 150% adamant that you're gonna see this as like a, a long-term career or long-term side hustle just because of the fees that goes into it and the extra work and admin. So I have a website with Shopify and I will put a link below um, so that you can sign up if that's what you would like to do. Um, I really like Shopify because I have got it looking perfect so it's branded exactly the way I want it to be. You instantly can tell that it's HGDC. Um, it's got a really good dashboard, it's got really good analytics, like so many things available that even I haven't harnessed fully so that I can get more sales. Um, and it just means that those people, when they purchase from my website, I see more of the money because there's less fees. Um, the fees that I pay to Shopify and to PayPal or whatever are less than what I end up paying to Etsy. It means that I've got more control over my fees because Etsy, so you, you might set your price, for example, at eight pounds, but if somebody from a different ge geographical location visits, they might pay more or less because Etsy slightly changes the price due to tax reasons. Um, whereas that won't happen on your website, the price is the price. However, you then are responsible for taxes in other locations, which can be a little bit of a mind mess because Brexit. But we'll just leave that there for now. Um, and then the other benefits of having your website is people that purchase from you are your customers. Whereas if somebody purchases from you on Etsy, you don't have an option to be able to send them out any marketing emails or any deals or discounts. Um, they still belong to Etsy ultimately, which means that if your Etsy shop was to go down, then your entire customer base disappears. Whereas with your own website, you can build your own marketing, you can build your own email list, your newsletter, and it means that if all of the social media platforms were to go down overnight or disappear, you could still access everybody via email. So there's loads of different considerations there, um, and it really does depend on where you are within this journey. But if this is like your first pattern, then I'd probably say pick 
three platforms at most and I would go with Ravelry if it's accessible, Etsy and maybe Lovecraft. Um, the only thing with all of them as I said is their own different fees and I've covered all of this in my second workbook. Again, I'm just going to shamelessly plug it because it's there to give you all of this information. So I've got tables about um, all the different fees and links so that you can keep up to date with their fee structure. And then like how their payment details work and when you get your payouts. Um, and so that you can like make an informed choice when you list on that website. And the only other thing I'm going to add to that is if you are new then don't think that it's a problem if you're on multiple platforms i think it can be a really good thing because the more places you are the more likely that you are to show up and also i know um for some people they don't trust my website because it's a .co.uk website so they would rather pay on etsy because they think it's more trustworthy even though my website is legit and shopify covers all the payments and whatnot so sometimes it's useful just to have multiple places for people to find you they might go on your website and you only have two patterns and they think maybe it's a scam or they're not sure if you're the real deal and they can check on etsy and see that you've got a dozen reviews or they go onto ravelry and see that 20 people have made your project so i think the more places you can show up the more likely that you are to be found and get a sale The simplest answer to that is I make patterns that I'm genuinely excited about and can't wait to show off and then I will post about them on Instagram, I will show them off here on YouTube and from there I will then be able to sort of gauge from the interaction and the excitement that I get back whether it would do well as a pattern or not. So if like nobody comments, no one's interested then it's not likely to sell very well but if I've got people saying is this going to be a pattern I can't wait to make this I've already picked my colours and things like that then I can tell that it's already going to do well then once you've posted you can also like increase the interest in it so that it will have more sales quite simply the easiest ways to do that the most effective ways to do that are to just consistently keep posting about them find new and interesting ways to post about um, whatever your latest pattern is. So maybe you do a, a reel of you wearing it, maybe you do um, a reel, like a time lapse showing you working on it, maybe you give different style ideas in like a post where you swipe, maybe like there's just, you're basically talking about the same thing but you are finding different ways to present it so that one, you don't get boring, and two, so that it, it still feels new and exciting and you're showing more of it off. Another way to get great interest is to have really good testers because they will take amazing pictures, they will be your own mini fan club and they will post about the pattern and then they will share it with their audience which means that more people see what it is that you're working on and that can make a huge, huge difference. And also, it ultimately boils down to you just you have to have a good pattern um, because if your pattern is no good no one's really going to be interested and also that you just need to be really connected with your audience so like my tribe on Instagram are there because they love granny squares they like the bright colors and they like making things out of granny squares and so if I deliver them a granny square project that's like fun and cute and colourful then they're probably going to like it whereas if I was to drop like I don't know something more like textured and um, maybe like all one colour might not be their jam because that isn't what they were following me for so you need to know your audience and your audience really needs to know you um, that's not to say that something slightly different wouldn't do well because they still can do well but having a really good pattern that you're genuinely into and that your audience are excited for is just the best way to go about getting those sales and then on top of that you can then move into other things like adverts so on Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, Etsy, whatever else um, and then maybe you could get work with influencers um, 
just different ways to get more eyes on your patterns, whether that be an influencer post about it, or maybe you're featured in a magazine, maybe you're on a podcast, all these different ways. The more people that see you, the more sales that you could get. Question five, have you found it difficult to make a living in such a niche area? No. First of all, I don't really think it's a niche area because when I did a little bit of research, Wikipedia, I'm just going to caveat this with, I know Wikipedia isn't the best for information, but just roll with me here. Wikipedia stated that in March 2020, there was over 9 million registered users on Ravelry. And I know that not all of those were active. However, that is a huge, huge amount of people. And that is just one platform. There's also multiple, multiple platforms out there. If you search hashtags for knitting or crochet on Instagram, you would get thousands, if not millions of posts on that as well. And there are so, so many people out there that crochet and knit that it gives you a really, really huge audience. Um, and if you start to look at the numbers, you realise that it's not necessarily niche because you can easily make the numbers that you that you have set yourself as a target. I would also say, no, it's not been difficult because in effect, you trade one lot of stresses for another. There's pros and cons to being self-employed and employed. Um, so I'm just gonna run through those with you. I think the downside is the irregular cash flow. So when you're self-employed, money comes in because you have sold a product or produced a pattern or whatever it is. Um, in one month you might get a thousand downloads and another month you might get 10 and although you can influence that in some way there's always going to be a fluctuation um whereas when you are employed then you know that if you do whatever it is that your contract to do that you're going to receive x amount of money at the end of the month or week or whatever your pay period is so that is a downside another downside is that you if you're ill, you won't get sick pay. You're gonna to have to rely on your own savings. Um, and that has tested me this year because I started off the year not very well. Um, and then I got COVID and that wiped me out for a good eight weeks. Um, and so thankfully because of savings, it's not been a problem. Um, but if you didn't have those savings or that buffer there, then it could get a little bit hairy and a little bit stressful. However, I didn't get sick pay from my previous job anyway, and statutory sick pay was so minimal that it makes no difference. So it depends on your own circumstances. Um, and I'm just gonna say with that as well, if you then are not very well, the business grinds to a halt if you're not working, which means that it doesn't just impact that month, it impacts the future months because of how long it might take you to release a pattern and whatnot. So it's all things that you really need to bear in mind. Um, I think another downside is that you pay your own taxes. I don't see it as a downside. I think that the more tax you pay is more just a testament to how much money you've earned. So that doesn't bother me. But I know for other people, it's an issue because your employer might pay for your pay your taxes, but there's actually something that you need to set aside and pay yourself. And there's accounting fees if you choose not to do it yourself. Um, and another downside is. The discomfort, the anxiety, um, second guessing yourself, all of those things because you're now the one that's in control if it's not working out, it's, some, it's down to you ultimately and that's quite heavy to um, carry and it can feel quite stressful because when you're at, in a job, like you're employed, you can moan about management and say, oh, they don't do this properly and they don't do that and this would make the job so much easier but there isn't anyone to badmouth or complain or place all the blame on when it's your when it's you it's you it all comes to you and that can be a lot um but then there's loads of good sides so you pick who you work with you pick where you work you pick your hours so if you don't want to work in an office if you don't want to commute if you want to work from your bed then you choose to do that if you don't want to work with people with certain values 
or that don't have the same values as you, then you don't work with them. That's entirely up to you and that is amazing and very, very freeing. Also means that depending on your revenue streams, you are not trading hours of your time for cash. So that means that you can make sales anytime. So for example, when I wasn't very well, I still had sales going through and people were finding my website, Etsy, so-and-so and buying patterns and that's amazing. When you can't even drag yourself out of bed because you are that ill yet you still have a way of making an income. I can't even explain how amazing that feeling is. It's so, so good. And then I've also put compound interest. So let me give you this example that I've got here about it being niche and the money and how it all stacks up. So say for example, you work a um, hourly job and you get $10, we're working in US dollars here people, $10 per hour, you do 10 hours a day, five days a week. That means at the end of the week, you come out with 500 US dollars, which is $2,000 a month. Um, say that then you want to become a crochet designer and you then have crochet patterns that are like $5 a pattern. That means that if you need to get to $2,000, then that's 400 patterns. I'm just going to caveat here and say you're going to need to pay taxes on whatever you earn. So if you need $2,000 before tax, then you set your income target a bit higher, okay? But roll with me here. Um, and say, for example, the $5 a pattern and you, you decide, okay, I can release two patterns a month. So that means that I need to sell 200 copies of my pattern, of my two patterns per month to reach my dollars that I need for my income target. Sorted. Um, and then when you start to think about, okay, is this a niche area? Well, you need 200 people to buy two of your patterns a month. And if you have 2000 people following you on Instagram, then that's just 10% of your following. And then say in like a year's time, your following grows and you've got 20,000 people, then 10,000 becomes, 10% uh, becomes 2000 people. And all of a sudden your income has hugely jumped. Now, I know that just because you've got a big Instagram following doesn't mean you're gonna get sales. Um, and equally, if you have a small one, doesn't mean that you won't make many sales. I've also put here that there are also other ways of increasing your revenue. So that could be having diverse revenue streams. So I've done the two videos on different um, ways to make income from your crochet. And you can also add in like affiliate links to your patterns. You could add in, um, you could also have Patreon, you could have YouTube and get the AdSense. Um, you, there's so many different ways that you can have differing streams of income. So it's not all just based on just your patterns as well, which then means that if something happens and you don't have a pattern to put out the next month, it's okay, you've got other sources of income. Plus the other bonus is compound interest, which basically means that the more patterns you put out there, the higher your average basket value. So that means that, say you are a new designer, you have three patterns, $5 each, it's $15, and somebody comes along and thinks, I'll buy all three, I really like them. And in a year's time, you've got 10 patterns and somebody thinks, I'm gonna buy five of them. And then you've just had $25 go through, which then means that you need less people to buy patterns because they this person has spent more. And also, again, compound interest in that the more that um, you show up on social media, the more that you have a marketing strategy, marketing strategy, the more people are gonna come and find your patterns and the more it just continues to grow. So when you start breaking it down into numbers and then you realise there's 9 million users on Ravelry and I need 200 to 400 people to buy one to two patterns per month, suddenly it's not so niche and actually it's pretty easy. Don't get me wrong, it has its own stresses, you work hard just like you would in any job, but it works. Okay, last question, question six. How do you get the courage to write, test, edit, and sell a pattern, question mark? You alluded to wanting to do this for some time, three years, I think, in brackets, and now you've finally done it, woohoo. 
Um, but what was the thought process like? What obstacles did you have to overcome and how did you overcome those? So, I've broken this down into a couple of segments. So, first of all, for me, designing and crochet are like second nature. The more I crochet, the more design ideas that come out and the more that I just, I have to try them out and I want to see them become patterns um, or at least like, I want to see the, the design become an actual sample. And then every time I post about them, generally I get enough of an indication that it would be a good pattern to produce to sell. Now, you don't have to make just to sell. You can make for the sake of making. You can make something and think, I'm never gonna sell this and that's fine. Um, but also, it's, al it's also really, really nice that something you enjoy so much and that you get so much creative fulfillment from you can then um produce an income from like this is a really real sweet spot i'm going to address the thought processes next um for me thought process was like the biggest self-imposed obstacle um i had loads of doubts and loads of questions and i was like am i good enough can i do this what will people think um, like how do I do this and that was a lot to navigate and I think I got in my own way quite a lot with that as well um, and I actually have put together a little guide it's called five things I wish I knew before I became a crochet designer now that promotes my workbooks so as you read that you will see plenty on the workbooks in there however if you don't intend to buy the workbooks or you're not interested, you can still get a lot of value from that free guide. Um, I will link it below, you can download it on my website and I cover the questions such as, what if they don't support me? I'm not good at maths, how will I find the time? And it talks you through like the struggles that I faced and how I then got through these because I realized that a lot of new designers such as yourself probably feel in the same way and then there's a few action points at the bottom of each one as well so that you can like start tackling them um, and hopefully that'll be really really helpful for you it's something that I wish that I could have accessed when I first started because um, the in all honesty I think everyone must face those sorts of fears and it's just whether you're gonna let them hold you back or whether you're gonna jump in um, and so it's really useful to hear from somebody else so that you can jump in and not have that sense of panic of like, what am I doing? Um, and then in terms of how do I find the courage, I think the main obstacle for me was knowledge. I didn't really know how to write up the pattern, what I needed to include. I didn't know how to do grading. I did not know the best ways to produce samples or the marketing or what platforms to use or like it was just a lot to learn and so it was the knowledge that definitely held me back so as I started to um, venture out there I use a lot of free guides I did a couple of courses on different bits and pieces and ultimately just jumped in and took messy messy imperfect action and that's what I encourage you to do um, you're never gonna get it perfect. It's, you just, nothing ever is perfect and you just can't hold yourself to that standard. However, you can do things really, really well. And as you learn, you can continue to evolve and level up. It's a process of constant evolution, tweaking, reflection, and just trying out new things. If something doesn't work, it doesn't work. And if it does work, then great always going to be a work in progress and that's okay because I love doing what I'm doing so there are definitely processes and systems and ways to make it easier and quicker for yourself without a doubt but I wouldn't have figured out any of those without taking the first steps which is basically messy imperfect action and because of my lack of knowledge and just not knowing where to start that is why I've put together the workbooks and what I want is to have a community for people so that when you are new to all of this or wherever you are within your journey, there's somebody you can turn to and be like, is this normal? 
how do I do this? So this happened, what should I do? And I think that's just invaluable. Had I have had the workbooks and this community, when I started designing, it wouldn't have took me the two, three years of dithering, trying to figure things out. I just jumped in and got it done. And had I been putting patterns out over the last three years, I'd have so many more patterns on my website right now. As it is, I kind of learnt the hard way. I don't want you lot to have to do that. Um, so that's why the HDDC hub has been formed and that's why the workbooks are there. I'm going to link them all below. As I said, this is messy, imperfect action, uh, learning as I go, and I've never put together a community like this before. So that's a whole other thing that I'm learning. Um, and it's continually evolving and it's continually growing. So I'm going to put the links below for whatever is available now and then hopefully in a year's time there'll be even more links because I'll have even more available for you. So I hope that's useful. Please check out my website because there are some free guides on there um, and that should really, really help you. And if you wanted to go on to the next step then there are also paid for products on there. And then there's a few more videos that I'll link below that might help you out as well. I've done a few um, videos for the HDDC hub which cover differing aspects. And if you have any more questions, Sarah, or if anybody else has any other questions because of this video, then drop them below. I'll do my best to answer them or I'll just do another video. So I hope that helps. I've covered everything and I'll see you soon. Take care. What is that word? Oh my gosh, I can't think.